Your Bible, if you would, please. We have been going through a series on Abraham, the life of Abraham. And uh, do we have a video back there by chance? We do? Okay, well, I'm going to let Bob's video from last week give us about a three-minute review of where we are at this point in time. <laughs> Let me recap for you what we've already seen in the life of Abraham. Abraham was a happy pagan living in Ur of the Chaldees. His, uh, he, he heard God. Somehow he knew this is the one true God when God came to him and spoke to him and said, I want you to leave your city. I want you to leave your possessions. I want you to leave your family. And I want you to go to a place and I'll show you where it is. And that's all the information Abraham has. And for whatever reason, he had the faith to believe that this is the one true God and to respond in obedience to what God called him to. So he moved from what is modern day Iraq down, followed the, the track of the Euphrates River up to the north, settled at Hebron, uh, or, or settled, excuse me, settled in uh, Haran up in the north. That's where his father Terah died. After that, he came down along uh, uh, into Canaan and settled there between Bethel and Ai, and that's where God came and spoke to him and gave him the first iteration of the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis chapter 12. He says to him, I will bless you, I'll make you a great nation, I will bless all the nations of the earth through you, I'll bless those who bless you, I'll curse those who curse you, I'm going to make your name great. <laughs> okay, well, I'm not sure how far I got there. But then, uh, let's see, so he has, a, he has a, basically a failure of faith, if you will, or backslides a little bit in the second half of 12. He goes down to Egypt because there's a famine and because Sarah's beautiful. And at that point in time, he was afraid that, the, that Pharaoh or somebody would kill him to get his wife because she was so beautiful. He says, she's my sister. So he, she is his half-sister. But he lies, basically, he deceives them for the purpose of saving his own hide. And Pharaoh takes her in, but in God's providence, uh, he strikes Pharaoh's household with a plague, and Pharaoh figures out that uh, my earpiece has fallen out, that um, obviously that he's not supposed to have her, and he, he gives her back to, uh, to Abraham, and they go back, and then and gives, and by the way, he gives Lot, or he gives uh, Abraham lots of stuff to take back with him, kind of as a, as a parting gift, and they go back to, uh, to Canaan, and they're there, and the land is such that they have so many flocks and herds and people now in their party that the land can't support them. So they separate, and he gives Lot first choice. And Lot looks out, and he sees the, the Jordan River Valley that looks so well watered, and he selfishly picks that for himself. And then last week, Bob talked about in chapter uh, 14, he said how we see two pictures or two types of the Messiah, of Christ in that, in the first half of chapter 14 that Lot you know, pitches his tent toward Sodom and there's this confederation of kings led by a guy named Keterleomer and he comes in and he attacks that area and he takes Lot captive and Abram raises up a private army it was kind of, if any of you remember Blackwater I think from Iraq you know that was the mercenary army that, that was there helping with security it was kind of the Blackwater of the day and he goes in and he gets Lot, uh, Lot back from Keterleomer and that confederation of kings and how that's a picture of Christ who will come is our warrior and deliver us from captivity to sin and death. And then in the second half, as a result of that, this obscure figure named Melchizedek shows up and he's the king of Salem, which means peace. And it says he's a priest of the God Most High and he blesses Abram. He receives blessing from Melchizedek. So that brings us up to uh, Genesis chapter 15. And let me just say, and I think Bob said this when we started on in this series, you know, Abraham's name at this point is Abram, which means exalted father. God hadn't changed his name yet to Abraham, the father of multitude. So if I call him Abram or Abraham or Abe as I use in my notes, then you're going to know that I'm talking about the same guy, okay? So beginning in Genesis 15, verse 1, it says, um, well, let me read it to you. I'll tell you what, open up your Bibles and I'll read it. we'll read along together here. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you've given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. 
and behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I'm the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? And he said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for four hundred years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete." When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking firepot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Let me pray for us. Father, we ask that you would bless this time, bless this word that we have just read, that this would be a time that brings you great honor and glory and that edifies the body. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this isn't the first time that God has spoken or appeared to Abraham. As I just said, he's done that to him before. He's appeared to him before. And he starts out, but well, this time he, see, he shows up in a vision. It starts out, it says, after these things... And these things are those things I just spoke of in chapter 14. It's the, the capture of Lot by the kings. And it's Melchizedek showing up to bless Abraham. So those are these things. And God says, first he says to him, he says, Fear not, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. He's saying, don't be afraid, Abram. It's okay, I've got you and I'm going to take care of you. And you know, why the fear not? I, looking at that, was it because he feared reprisal of that confederation of kings that he had just fought, that Keterleomer and those guys would come back and attack him again, maybe so, or you know, maybe it was like how angels typically do when we see them appear in Scripture, right? What's the first thing they often say? They say, fear not, because their appearance is scary. So whatever the source of Abram's fear was, God says, don't worry about it. It's going to be okay. I'm going to protect you. And then he tells Abram, he says, I'm your shield and your reward shall be very great and what's Abram's response you know he doesn't go yes thank you Abram says what can you give me he says you've told me I'm going to have a son and I still don't have a son so it's as if Abram is saying you know you're telling me my reward is great but here's the only thing I want and if that's not what you're going to give me I appreciate it but why is that a great reward you know he's promised him he says that that he's going to have a son that's going to be the heir. And he says, I want somebody that's my own flesh and blood. And at this time, also childlessness, childlessness was thought maybe it was a divine judgment from God. And maybe that's what Abram's thinking as well uh, in light of the fact that God has already promised him that he would give him his son. Or possibly Abram's looking beyond his own self-interest and he's thinking, you know, you've told me I'm going to have the seed that's going to bless all the nations and how's that going to happen if, if I don't have the seed, if I don't have the son? So Abram tells God, he says, you know, I, I don't have this son yet. I don't have this male heir, so the, the heir of my house is going to be Eliezer of Damascus. And evidently Eliezer was some trusted member of his household. We don't really know who Eliezer was. But if you look at verse 4, it says, And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And God tells him, he says, it's not going to be Eliezer. He said, that's not what's going to happen. He said, but it's going to be somebody who is going to come from your own body. It's going to be your very own son. 
You know, and that, again, based on what Abram's just said about that great reward that he wants, if I'm him, I can see him going, yes, you know, end zone dance, right? Okay, he's promised to me again, and it's going to happen. And God says, come outside with me. I want you to come outside, and I want you to count the stars if you're able to count them, because so shall your offspring be. You know, we've probably all tried to count the stars before. I remember one night, particularly as a small child, we lived out on the farm out in the country, when I was a kid, and it was one night after dark, and we were driving into town, and I don't remember what the occasion was, but I remember that I was in the back seat, and I crawled up on the back shelf above the back seat, and I laid down there looking out that back window to try and count the stars. It was a, it was a clear, dark night, and for those of you now, all the smallest kids are back there, but just know these were pre-seat belt days. Okay, and as soon as my, I had good parents, as soon as I said, you can keep straight what you've already counted, which you can't do, but even if you could do that, there's just too many of them to count. And that's what God tells Abram. He says, that's how your offspring's going to be. There's going to be too many of them to count. And that brings us up to the well-known verse 6. Everybody look at verse 6 with me. It says, and he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Abram believed God. He believed what God was telling him. And God credited, right, credited righteousness to him. The word of the Lord, as it said, came to Abraham. And by that I mean the light went on. Abram understood something in a new way, or in a way more fully than he'd ever stood, understood it before. And as soon as I say that, the question is, what was it he understood? What was it that he believed in? And what does it mean to be counted as righteousness? So we're going to camp out on verse 6 here a little bit. Uh, I, I was talking to Curtis Thomas earlier this week about this passage, and he made this statement to me. He said, Genesis 15, 6 is the John 3, 16 of the Old Testament. And I thought, I know that's what I did. I went, oh, yeah, that's good. I said, Curtis, can I use that? He says, absolutely. So just to, just to kind of level set us, let's all say John 3, 16. I know probably most of us know that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Very good. Well, in order to better understand verse 6, we're going to turn to the New Testament because very often the New Testament's the very, the very best commentary on the Old Testament. And that's the case here for us. So we're going to look at Romans chapter 4 so if you'll be turning to Romans chapter 4 we're going to spend a little bit of time there it helps us interpret Genesis 15 6 you know it's kind of like when Jesus tells a parable to the to the people listening and you're going what does that really mean and then the disciples go what does that really mean and he explains it to them and you go thank you Lord now I understand it and that's what Romans 4 does helps us with in, in uh, Genesis 15 6 and also Galatians 3 that we're going to look at a little bit so um, we're, context for Romans 4 is Paul is telling the church at Rome he's, he said all of mankind has fallen he said we're all sinners and that none of us no matter what we do can justify ourselves before God we can't follow the law we're not going to be good enough to make ourselves right with God and he says that righteousness can only be attained by faith in Jesus so beginning in verse 1, I'm going to read through 8 of Romans 4. It says, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed the Lord, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Not to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Paul is telling Abraham, he's saying... Or Paul is saying that Abraham was made righteous by faith. He wasn't made righteous by works. And I say that, that's our first principle. It's a core doctrine. And that is that justification by faith alone. We're justified before God by faith alone. And Paul goes on in Romans 4 and verses 9 and 12 just summarizing. He's saying that 
You know, Abraham wasn't counted righteous because he obeyed the law of circumcision. Because this scene here that we're seeing is before circumcision came about. That's later on. We'll talk about that later on in the series. So it wasn't obedience to the law that made Abram righteous. It was by faith that he was counted righteous before God. Picking back up still in Romans 4, look down at uh, verse 16 with me. I'm going to read to the end of the chapter. It says, that is why it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, Father Abraham. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations, in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead, and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope he believed against hope, that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been told so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old. And when he considered the barren... And we're going to look at those last three verses about Jesus here again in just a minute. But for, for a moment, I want to talk about what faith is and what faith isn't. And here's what faith is. It's the means by which we're linked to Jesus, and thereby his righteousness is counted or imputed to us. In other words, his righteousness, the righteousness of Christ, is credited to our account. And let me read from, uh, Terry gave me this this morning. She was reading this from righteousness. Rather, it is the instrument that we exercise to lay hold of the ground upon which the Lord's verdict of righteousness is pronounced. So we aren't justified by faith itself. Rather, we're justified through faith. And specifically, that is through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, I say all that, and at the time of Abraham, we all know that Jesus was years in the future. I think it was about 2,000 years in the future before Christ came. So, if we're justified through faith in Christ, that still begs the question, what was Abraham's faith in? What did he believe, or what was his content, or the content of his faith? You know, was he made righteous merely because he believed God said, I'm going to send you a son, and I'm going to make uh, him a great nation? Was that, was that what the basis of his faith was? Because he believed that because they were both old and his wife was barren. So now let's look back at Romans 4, those last three verses I told you we're going to look at again. It says, but the words it was counted to him, this is verse 23, but the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. I read that and I go, fine. But still, we're on this side of the cross, and that makes sense to us. We all understand that because we can look back at that. But what about Abraham? If nobody comes to faith through in the Father, nobody comes to the Father except through faith in Christ, and it's still the question still stands, what did Abraham believe and why did God count him righteous? And again, we're going to get more help from the New Testament, and we're going to look at Galatians 3. So turn with me to Galatians 3. And while you're doing that, what's going on here in Galatians, if you remember, Paul's writing to the Galatian church because what's happened is some false teachers have infiltrated the, ter the church there. And they're preaching a false gospel. And it's one that requires circumcision. And I like verse 1 in chapter 3. It starts out with that great line. He says, Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Or in the present day vernacular, Paul might say, You boneheads, what are you thinking? You know, what's, what's up with you? What's wrong with you guys? So look at verse 7 with me. It says, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, And you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Look back at that verse 8 I just read. It says, The scripture preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, And you shall all the nations be blessed. You know, I read that and I go, That's the gospel? That doesn't sound like much of the gospel. Maybe a little bit, but not much of the gospel to me. So look in Galatians 3 still. still look down at verse 16. More help. It's going to say, Now the promises were made to Abraham and his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. And I go, bingo, he was talking about Jesus. 
And one more New Testament passage. You don't have to turn there. But uh, it's John 8, 56. And there Jesus is in one of his smackdowns with the Jewish religious leaders. You know, they're having it out. And Jesus makes that statement. He says, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So when Abraham believed the Lord, it was counted to him as righteousness. And what he believed was the gospel. Now, we all know that Scripture's progressive in its revelation. So did Abraham fully understand the gospel? What did he really understand there? And I would say he understood enough to be counted righteousness. You know, he understood enough to be saved, as we would say today. Jesus said Abraham rejoiced to see his day. And does that mean that Abraham knew Jesus' name? Maybe, but I don't know. And does that mean that Abraham understood that Jesus would die on a cross for his sin? Maybe, but I don't know. But he did understand. Here's what he understood. He understood that he couldn't be justified by his own works, by his own merit, and that he was justified solely by God's mercy. And I think it's quite possible he grasped the concept of a redeemer. And this is something that I do know, that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross paid for the sins of Abraham and everybody else in the Old Testament who looked forward by faith, just as it paid for the sins of us and all of us on this side of the cross who look backward by faith. Because like Abraham, we are made righteous by faith, not by works. We're justified by faith alone. And another way that we're like Abraham, even though that we're on this side of the cross, there's still things in Scripture that we don't understand, aren't there? You know, I think about things like uh, that we have to look forward to by faith. The new heaven and the new earth. You know, the Bible tells us that, that uh, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. And so in this point in our point in time and space continuum, there's just things that we don't know and that we look forward to by faith and we trust to the Lord. But we do know the fully revealed gospel. You know, we know that now, even if Abraham may or may not have understood that. And that is that Jesus, God's son, came to earth and that he lived the sinless life and that he fulfilled all of the law so that he would be a perfect sacrifice and that obedience, he died on the cross. And while he was there on that cross, God poured out his wrath, his judgment on sin for all of his people. And Jesus died and he rose from the dead on the third day victorious over sin and death and that he ascended into heaven and that is where he sits now on the right hand of the Father you know and in a crowd this size I always want to ask the question do you believe that is that what you believe you know is that something that you're still struggling with are you a child of Abraham are you justified by faith and is it God's Christ's righteousness credited to you because if you're still trying to justify yourself, if you think, I just have to get myself right before I can believe that because I'm just still too much of a sinner, then you're never going to get there. You're never going to be good enough, and you're never going to be made right by your own efforts. You know, the word gospel means good news, and it's something I said a couple of weeks ago. One aspect of the good news is you don't have to go to hell. Okay, God's made a way for us. And that when we're telling people about Jesus, and I, I've realized this more and more, you know, it's not about winning the argument, okay? It's not about the other person understanding that I'm right and they're wrong. That's not the point. The point is God's glory, more worshipers to bring God more glory, and the salvation from damnation of that individual soul. That's the point of sharing the gospel with one another, okay? I mean, it's just not like trying to get them to think like me. That's not the point of it. So, I want to sum up verses 1 through 6 of Galatians 15. Justification by faith alone. It's the core doctrine of the faith, and it's contrary to our nature. So we need to remember that. Look back at Genesis 15. We're going to look at the last portion of the chapter. We're going to start out there with verse 7. God says to him, he says, I'm the Lord who brought you here to give you this land to possess. Then Abraham, who we've just talked about his great faith, and the New Testament tells us all that, and he says how he believed and credited his righteousness, he goes, O oh Lord, how shall I know that I shall possess it? And that sounds a little weird to me. You know, I read that, and I go, it's kind of like 
are you doubting again? What's the deal, you know? It's like, uh, pardon me, God, can you help me out here? And God, in his kindness to him, takes him out but, and tells him and does his covenant. But, you know, as I read that about Abraham's question to God when he says, you know, how, how will I know this? It made me think about that, that uh, episode in Luke 1 where Zechariah, the priest, is in the temple and the angel appears to him and he says, you're going to have a son. Your wife, Elizabeth, is going to give birth to John the Baptist. And what does Zechariah say? He says, how shall I know this for I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. And what happens to Zechariah? Gabriel zaps him, right? He can't speak. He says, because you didn't believe, you're not going to be able to speak until John is born. And I look at that and then I look at Abram here questioning God going, how will I know this? And I go, why didn't God zap Abraham? You know, and as soon as I ask that, I go, God, why don't you zap me? Because I do the same thing probably just about every day. You know, when I go, why, or how long, or how, come, how can you let this go on, or why hadn't you fixed this? Or look at what's going on around you. Look at our country. God, do something about this. You know, so as I try to reconcile that, I look at the, the language. It says, Abraham says, O oh Lord God. You know, he starts out acknowledging who God is. And Zechariah just says, how shall I know this? You know, but that language isn't inclusive, right? But what is, is God looks at our heart. There's no secrets hidden from him. And I, and I say all this to point out the fact that God is gracious and patient with us, as he is here with Abraham. And it's not always wrong for us to ask God why. If we go to him humbly in faith and ask him sincere questions, he is gracious and entertains our questions. I'd like to paraphrase a friend, and uh, one time I heard her say, she says, do I go to God asking questions humbly with an open hand, or do I go to him demanding answers with a clenched fist? I think that's a good picture for us. So God graciously responds to Abraham, and he does that by cutting the covenant, literally. He tells Abraham, he says, get these sacrificial animals, and I want you to, to cut them in half, and I want you to line them up here, half on each side so there's an aisle that you can walk down the middle of there and Abraham does that and as Bob alluded to in his newsletter this week that's where we get the the phrase to cut a deal it comes from this this old ancient way of of cutting a covenant uh, and then in verse 12 it says the sun's going down and this deep sleep falls on Abram and then dreadful and great darkness comes upon him and God gives him some new information. It's something he hadn't told him before. He says that those descendants I've promised you, said they're going to they're gonna go and they're going to be servants in a land that's not their own for 400 years. They're going to be afflicted. But then I'm going to deliver them. I'm going to bring judgment on their captors. And they're going to come out of that country and they're going to come out with a lot of stuff from their captors. And, of course, we know that fulfillment of that is Israel's enslavement in Egypt for the 430 years and God using round numbers here with Abraham and then verse 15 God tells Abraham he says you're going to die at a good old age and I read that and I think what a kindness that God was of God to tell that to Abraham he says you're going to go to your fathers in peace and you're going to die to a good old age and I, that's, you know, that's something we'd all like to know but if we are in Christ we should know that you know, we don't know the when and how of our death but if we're in Christ, whether we die at a good old age or we die at a good young age, because nobody dies early in God's timetable, okay? Nobody dies early. But we can die in peace, in that peace that passes understanding. You know, in talking about death, I, I want to just pause here a minute. I know the five- to eight-year-olds are in the back. All of us adults here, we've thought about our own death before. I certainly have. And I remember the first time, I vividly remember one of those childhood memories, the first time I thought about my own death. We had our, our family's best friends, two families, and some of their kids, the ages matched up with some of ours, and I was staying at their house one night. I think I was seven to eight years old, somewhere in there. And I didn't spend the night out regularly at seven to eight years old, but because we were best friends, I was over that night. And uh, they, they went to bed early, and I was a night owl. And so we went to bed, and I don't know, probably 10 o'clock or maybe even before the lights are out, and I'd been laying in bed for probably a couple hours. I mean, it was, I think, at least midnight. And you know how you've been there before, and sleep is not even on the horizon. And you're laying there, and your mind's wandering. And all of a sudden, this thought struck me that I was going to die one day. And that's the first time I've ever had that realization. And it scared me to death. 
you know, God and eternity just, they weren't part of my thinking. And I laid there and I was panic stricken. And I, even, I seriously thought about going and waking up my friend's mom to comfort me. But I was too embarrassed to do that. But I lay there for several minutes and as I, as I started to get control of my emotions, I rationalized with myself. And I said, you know, you're young, you've got a long time to live, you don't have to worry about that now. You know, it was kind of the Scarlet O'Hara theology and gone with the wind. I'll worry about that tomorrow. You know? Well, a lot of tomorrows have come and gone. You know? And we don't know what each day holds, do we? And I just say that because the future is uncertain in a sense and as far as we have any control of it. So, you know, if you're a young person here and even us old people, and I really want you to do this. I want you to just take a moment and look to your left and look to your right. Okay? You see that person next to you? They're going to die. That person, might, unless Jesus comes back first, okay? And certainly that could happen. But that person's going to die. All right? And you're on that person's left or right, which means you're going to die too. You know, and I don't, I don't say that lightly. I don't say that flippantly. But God has set the day of our death before we're ever born, Psalm 139 tells us. You know, but if you're a believer in Christ, it says precious is the death in the sight of the Lord of his children. Okay? If you look at some of the verses about death in the New Testament, a lot of them have a very positive aspect to us. I would even submit to you that as believers, death is a mercy of God. And, you know, we want to be careful when we say that to people. We want to be sensitive. But if we're a believer, death's our best day. And that's kind of hard to say, and it's a little bit scary to say. But I think it's the truth when we have the right perspective on our sin and what eternity holds for believers. And if you're not a believer, death's your worst day because there's no second chances. So Scripture tells us to examine ourselves and see if you're in the faith. And I just encourage you to do that in what we've been talking about in terms of the gospel. So after that rabbit trail, let's look back to our text. Let's look at verse 16. God tells Abraham that his descendants are going to come back to the land in the fourth generation. And he says, For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And that's just a great biblical understatement. And the reason I say it's a great biblical understatement because you know that what happens when he finally brings them out of Egypt and tells them to take the land, he says, Wipe them all out. Their iniquity is complete. You know, God's going to use Israel as his instrument of judgment on them for their godless practices for the practices of idolatry of gross sexual immorality and child sacrifice and that sounds like America doesn't it it sounds a little bit like us today but here in Genesis 15 God in his kindness and in his justice he gives the Amorites time to repent and he's doing the same for us in America today he's given us time to repent so pray for revival Pray that we would do that, that revival would come to America. Verse 17, it says, When the sun had gone down, it was dark. Behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, and all those other ites. And looking at that cutting of the covenant, you know, when he had those animals laid, laid out with the walkway in between, typically what would happen when a covenant like that was done, the two parties would walk between those cut animal pieces, and that would symbolize what would happen to either party if they didn't fulfill their part of the covenant. But notice what happens here. Abram doesn't walk between the animals, does he? Only God is represented by that fire pot and that flaming torch passes through those animals. And fire, obviously, is a common symbol for God, right? The flaming, the burning bush, the, the pillar of fire in the desert and Exodus and tongues of fire at Pentecost. So, so fire goes, I mean, God goes between that and the form of fire. And the point of that is, why did that matter to Abraham and why does that matter to us today? So again, to answer that, we're going to look back at the New Testament again because it speaks to this. We're going to look at Hebrews 6. And while you're turning to Hebrews chapter 6, let me give you the context of that. The writer, is, he's warning against apostasy, and he's encouraging the readers. He says, hold fast to the end. In verse 11 and 12, he said that he desires them to have the full assurance of hope until the end. And he's speaking about their salvation. That's what he's talking about. And he says, don't be sluggish, 
but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. He's saying be an imitator of Abraham is what he's telling them. Verse 13, look at that. It says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself. Continuing down in 17, verse 17, it says, So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That verse 17, it says, the heirs of the promise, and that's talking about us. That includes us. And what was promised? Well, he told Abraham, he said, I'm going to give you a son on whom all, through whom all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And uh, they're going to, the descendants of that son, of your descendants, they're going to possess the land. And, you know, here at this point in history, we've seen the fulfillment of that physically, hadn't we? We've seen, we know the fact that later on, Isaac, the son of promise, and Jacob, and all the patriarchs, and, the, and actually the geographical nation of Israel all came about. But... There's a greater spiritual fulfillment of that. That Christ is the seed. He's the promised son. And the blessing is the gospel for all the nations. And some would even say that the new heaven and new earth is the promised land. And God promises these things by himself. Okay, He is the promiser of that. This was true for the Abrahamic covenant, but it's also true for the gospel. The salvation for all who've placed their faith in Christ, it's certain anchor of our souls the person is the saving work of Christ you know some days I feel saved and some days I don't feel very saved but that's not the point God in Christ unconditionally promises to keep the new covenant and that's good news so these two principles I've talked about justification by faith in Christ alone salvation guaranteed by Christ alone they work together to secure our salvation. And I don't want to stretch this covenant picture too far, but I think there's one other thing for us here about the cutting of the covenant. You know, as, as Paul said, talking about back in Romans, that we're flawed by sin, and yet God's holy and God is just, and we can't be made right with him on our own. Our, but yet our sin has to be paid for. You know, if somebody goes out and commit murder, we can't just say, that's okay, we forgive you, go about your way. Justice demands satisfaction of that. And God's holiness demands satisfaction. So what happens? So Christ came as the sinless one, and he becomes like those sacrificial animals at the cutting of the covenant. And he was cut off for our transgressions, and by his wounds were healed. Well... What else can we learn here? Why do, again, why does this matter in our daily lives? And I'll tell you why it matters, because we're like Abraham. You know, he didn't realize these promises immediately, did he? Hebrews just told us, it says he had to continue to live by faith. And I don't want to get ahead of the story, but Isaac, that child of promise, he wasn't born for about 15 years after this encounter with God. You know, it wasn't a nine-month deal and says, oh, honey, by the way, guess what? You know, the stick is pink or whatever color it turns I'm not sure sorry it's been a long time <laughs> so anyway but uh, you know in, in, in next week we're going to see that there's going to be great conflict between Sarah Abraham's wife and Hagar the maid once Ishmael's born right it's, it's kind of like Abraham puts this new faith in God and things go from bad to worse you know life gets harder but that's also with a lot of help from himself and some others. And life's kind of like that for us sometimes, isn't it? We try to fix things, and we make them worse. Or sometimes they just get worse on their own. You know, at one point, Abraham here personally, he never possessed the promised land. Now, his innumerable descendants did, but Abraham didn't. So when we believe, it doesn't mean there's not going to be trials. It doesn't mean there's not going to be suffering. It doesn't mean there's not going to be long periods of waiting on God. The prosperity gospel is a false gospel. It deceives people and it misleads them. So you don't have to turn there, but I'm going to read 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 9. 
And it tells us what it means to continue to live by faith and to trust in the covenant-keeping God. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness, genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. I know there's some here this morning that have been dealing with long-term illness, and maybe it's serious illness. And some of you here this morning have been praying and hoping for years for the salvation of a mate or a loved one. Some of you here, maybe you're dealing with singleness or just numerous hardships and sufferings here that are in our midst. And as we suffer and as we wait, or as we suffer in our waiting, I ask you, is Jesus enough for you? He's not just the guarantor of our future, but he's also the guarantor of the present. And the certainty of our future should determine how we live in the present. So we do not, as Peter says, though we do not now see him, we believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible. You know, he tells us his grace is sufficient, that he'll never leave us or forsake us. He gives us the Holy Spirit that we can draw on in our time of need. He said, I've called you and I'm able and I will do it. So I want to ask you, are there promises of God that you're refusing to believe? Are, there, are you refusing to rest in Christ? Are there areas of doubt where you need to stop doubting? Because like Abraham, he calls us to persevere. And his promises can be trusted. We can rest in Christ. And should our culture continue, continue to decline, which seems likely, minus revival, we're going to become more and more the unwelcome guests in our nation. If we're Christ followers, we're going to be less liked than we already are. So the question for us is, will we wait with joy and faithfulness? Will we love our enemies? Will we love those who persecute us? while we look for a better country, not geographically, but we look for that better city whose architect and builder is God. And one other thing, you know, we need to remind ourselves we don't have to work to stay saved. You know, we know that, but sometimes that's how I live, and sometimes that's the motivation for the good works, for the service that I want to do. You know, it needs to be out of love for God. It needs to be out of gratitude for what he's done for me. Or am I trying to keep myself in good with God? But we also want to be careful of the other extreme. That extreme that says, once saved, always saved. So I can do whatever I want. You know, that's when liberty becomes license. And I like what Dietrich Bonhoeffer said about that. He said, grace becomes cheap grace. A grace that justifies sin, but not the sinner. So in a moment, we're going to come to the communion table where we remember Christ's sacrifice for us, his covenant keeping, his payment of our transgressions. And as we do, remember that Jesus has done the work for us, okay? He's done the heavy lifting. He made Jesus, God the Father, made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin so that in Jesus we might become the righteousness of God. It's justifica justification by faith guaranteed by God himself. It's that great exchange. Jesus takes our sin, we get our, his righteousness. And it's the greatest offer in the universe. So he bids us to come. He says, all who are weary and heavy laden, he's going to give us rest. But he also warns us. He says, if you don't know me, he says, don't come to the table. Because if you do, you eat or drink judgment on yourself. And if that's the case with you, you know, just stay in your seat. We have people that frequently do that. You're, nobody's going to think you're weird or strange. Okay, but stay there and think about what you've heard this morning. And if God's working on your heart, then see me after the service or see somebody you know who is a committed Christ follower and tell them what's going on and uh, they want to help you. And one other comment before we come to communion. It says when we do this, 
you know, we remember Christ's death. That's, that's the point, one of the major points of communion. But unlike the disciples that night in the upper room when the uh, Lord's Supper was instituted, you know, we know the rest of the story. We know that Jesus rose from the dead, don't we? So while the focus in the upper room is certainly on Christ's sacrifice, I think there's a joy that we should have in communion. The, the somberness tends to come to us pretty naturally in communion. We're good at that and we're practiced at that, and that's right and appropriate thing. But there's a joy to it. There's a somber joy to communion. Jesus rose from the dead. He didn't stay dead. So there's those two sides to the same of the same coin, his sacrificial death and his, his resurrection, because he has risen indeed. So to help us in that regard, we're going to sing a song before we take communion. And it's going to be a song that you know, but it's one that we typically don't associate with communion. And then after we sing, we're going to prepare the elements and do what we typically do, come down the outer aisles, take the elements and take those up the center aisle back to your seat. And uh, once we finish with the song, I'll, I'll uh, issue an invitation to come. Is risen from the dead. We are one. 
justified by faith, come and remember Christ's death and also his victorious resurrection, for he himself guarantees the victory. From Luke 22, and when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup and when he'd given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. We're going to close this morning with um, the chorus of How Great Thou Art, and then I'll dismiss, uh, dismiss us in a benediction. Bob, would you get us started? Then sings my soul, stand with us, my soul.
may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. You're dismissed. Amen. Thank you.